Chapter 5 The Archive The morning of the second day came with a thick, misly fog. Seward instructed the crew to take in all but the main sail and their pace began to slow. Abrin and G.A. headed to the prow to see what it was they were approaching. Ah, are we there? said Tepid, strolling over to join them. What should we be looking for? asked Abrian. Not too sure. I hoped you knew, actually, replied Tepid calmly. I haven't visited the place for a dreadfully long time. Why not? Shouldn't a prince know what's going on in all the parts of his kingdom? asked G.A. Tepid shook his head, smiling. Oh, on the contrary, E.A. I'm G.A., muttered the offended ghost. This particular land isn't under my authority. Abrian did a double take. It's not? Surely it must be. I thought Nausea was in charge of all these islands. Only the ones nearest the city and within the fishing grounds, said Tepid, wagging a finger at him. We left those quite some time ago. From here onwards, every piece of land is an authority, or principality, or kingdom, or fiefdom, or uh, so on, all of its very own. You mean like that one? asked G.A., looking ahead. Slowly approaching them, out of the fog, was an island, or perhaps at least half of one. It looked like it was in the middle of sinking. A great wedge of rock, towering hundreds of feet high at one end and barely visible above the waves at the other. As they drew closer, the topmost part of the island rose so high its peak disappeared into the fog and they had to crane their necks to see it. Far above them, they could hear the cries of distant seabirds. Once or twice, one of the birds would swoop past, gliding with wings wider than any of their arms at full stretch. These didn't seem bothered by their presence and performed artful, clever manoeuvres over, above and around them. Before long, the ship had drawn up very close to the sheer cliff face. Thin strands of silver were draped down its walls like fine hair. They were waterfalls, tinkling and chattering on their descent to the sea from the concealed highland above. Should we be this close? asked Hanno, looking cautiously up at the imposing rocks. You doubt my skill at the helm? chuckled Bly. These waters are very deep. There's no chance of running aground here. We can go as close as we like. He nudged the whipstaff as they passed the largest waterfall so far. Everyone felt the chilling spray hit their faces as the updraft took the tiny droplets away into the air. They had reached an inlet within the cliffs. With a few more nudges, Bly guided them into its mouth. At the other end of this inlet, there was a long dock, strung with tall lamps that had been lit despite the daylight. The anchor was dropped and ropes prepared. A figure, clad all in grey, stood waiting for them beside one of the lamps. As the mooring line was slung to one of the posts, they blew a long echoing note from a horn and called, Strangers from the sea, welcome to the Errol Isle. Our warmest and humblest greetings to you, said Tepid, striding down the gangplank and bowing. They are gratefully accepted. The grey person bowed politely. Oi, wait, 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 wait for me. Dominator jogged down the slippery plank and flung his head into a bow so hard it could have fallen off. You must be Mamama, he said, grinning broadly. The person dipped their head again. Good prince. Forgive me, but my name is Eyre, he said. If you please, I will be leading you to the Lady Mamia. Well, Mr. Eyre, it's a pleasure. Do lead on, said Dominator, ever the obstinate unbeliever in embarrassment. We are very grateful, my good sir, added Tepid. Eyre smiled languidly. The honour is mine. This way, if you will. Leaving the ship in the hands of its captain, the ATR and Tepid followed Air up the steep slope out of the inlet. The sailors had insisted Gina stay on board and learn what she'd missed while hiding as soup. She might have been looking forward to a fantastical adventure, free at last of entrapment at home, but Captain Ula was going to make it quite plain that adventures were a lot of hard work. Gina hadn't been too impressed about this and had only very reluctantly agreed. She glowered from the prow of the ship as she watched the straggling group disappear from sight into the mist. G.A. floated along at the back, trying to make out the landscape around them. 
they were climbing a thin line of steps carved out of the cliff face. For a few minutes there was only a narrow passage, flanked with immensely high rocks on their right and the long drop to the sea on their left. But then the steps curved inwards and rose steadily up to level ground. Do you think the people here like ghosts? asked G.A. quietly, thinking of nauseans and their superstitions. I don't know, said Delilah. Maybe ghosts are mentioned in the archive here, so people will have read about them. She wrinkled her eyebrows. G.A., do you think something about this place smells odd? Smells? repeated G.A. Sorry, I know you can't smell. It's just it feels like there's something familiar about it. I'm sure I've smelt it before, but I can't think where. What does it smell like? Delilah sniffed the air. Like white magic. Does it smell? said G.A., striving to remember what his own magic used to smell like. I never noticed. I just thought it looked kind of sparkly and pretty. Delilah shrugged. Well, it might be nothing anyway. Who knows what's actually on this island, said G.A. With all this mist, we can barely even see it. But this was soon to change. As they continued up the winding steps, the mist began to thin and slowly revealed the beginnings of a small settlement. Seabirds cried overhead and the wind whipped through the green and yellow grasses, filling the air with salt. Wide circular houses emerged with canvas walls, elaborately decorated and weathered. Some had thin chimneys sticking up out of the centre. The land surrounding each house had straggling collections of livestock, fishing nets, fences and bedraggled crops. These were covered over with sodden mats and canvas, failing defences against the weather's onslaught. Curious faces appeared in the doorways as the group passed. Looking around, Delilah's heart sank a little. In her mind, whispers of memories floated between the people she saw. She knew it as the look of a people downtrodden, but she wasn't sure where she'd seen it before. Air led them on towards the heart of the island. It was a long walk. Everyone was soon feeling little drops of rain falling from their hoods and hair into their eyes. G.A. noticed the houses seemed to be changing from canvas to wood. Small, square and round cabins with cloth coverings on the windows and doors. That wasn't to say there weren't any more of the canvas structures. They stubbornly popped up just when you thought there weren't any more of them. Wood transitioned to simple stone houses and then to grander and more ornate buildings. Even the people's clothes were evolving from simple cloth to embroidered fabrics and long flowing robes. The path was straighter now, lined with mossy stones polished smooth. Without warning, the houses abruptly stopped and they found themselves on a wide, circular lawn. In a warmer season, it might have been strewn with a hundred different sorts of flowers. There were pools, encircled with more stones that were arranged in strange shapes and patterns. G.A. thought he could hear the sound of running water. He soon identified the source. The water in the pools came from bubbling springs. The water was crystal clear and flowed out of the pools through narrow channels lined with intricate red and gold tiles that looked like blood against the deep green grass. The channels ran down the gentle slope until they converged into a large ring encircling a grand house. It was starkly different to the simple circular houses they had passed on the settlement's outskirts. Its walls were made of stone, painted in fine earthen hues of red and brown. The mantle over the wide door was golden, surrounded by carvings of creatures Chie had never seen before. Its roof was covered in blue slate that glistened in the spattering raindrops. High windows looked down across all the houses behind them, taking in every detail, leaving no piece of the surrounding land unwatched. Ew, whispered Dominator, squinting at the door carvings. Abrian elbowed him in the ribs. What? They're not exactly pretty. I know, but maybe they're not meant to be what you'd call pretty, hissed Abrian as they passed under the carvings into a wide meeting hall. They're authentic. I don't like authentic, 
says the one who's more authentic than all of us under all that magic, cut in Hono. You don't know the meaning of pretty, snapped Dominator, but before Hono could respond, a door slammed without warning. Tromotarechin sprung dash Wildesrag! Someone shouted from behind them. Spinning to face the origin of the foreign word, the group saw a short man being held roughly by two guards in full plate armour. The man was in a tunic made of thick natural fibres with his shaggy hair pulled back into a dark ponytail. As he kicked and screamed in his foreign tongue, the guards roared at him to be quiet, which only made him shout louder. Air deflated slightly and began to walk towards the scene erupting before them. Dare I ask what is going on here? Air asked sharply, causing the guards to snap to attention. The short man began shouting a tirade of words at Air, practically foaming at the mouth. Air nodded in understanding. Now... This gentleman has a complaint and has not been afforded the proper rights that we give to our great island's residents. The two of you need to escort him to Balin's house and, for goodness sake, bring a translator rather than making a scene in front of our important guests. Eyre said, with the authority one can only gain through age and experience. The guards shifted and agreed before escorting the man to where he needed to be. With a surprising amount of grace, Air brought his slender fingers to the bridge of his nose and took a deep sigh, muttering under his breath. Ah, oh, it never ends at this island. Air, is everything quite all right? Tepid asked. Never see the end of it. Turning to face the group with a wide smile and not a hint of the frustration he presented earlier, Air replied. Yes, sir. Shall we continue? He marched quickly past them and further into the building. EA and GA looked at each other and shrugged before continuing on with the rest of the group. Soon they were shown to a large room full of what seemed to be dignitaries and people of note. An immense throne stood empty at the far end. All the dignitaries were chattering away amongst themselves and didn't take any notice of them, even when Dominator seemed to be trying to force himself through impossibly small spaces between people. Hono rolled his eyes at the young prince's antics. Delilah looked at all the dresses and finery and felt very out of place and underdressed. G.A. simply did his best to stay opaque. Then a young woman entered the room and it was as if the whole world lit up. Her slender figure was beautiful and yet was held with the grace and presence of someone who had been raised from birth to be a ruler. Her left hand was lifted elegantly and held by what appeared to be her chief adviser a middling man with distinguished silver hair. Her floor-length azure dress was decorated with fine gold embroidery of elegant swirls and floral patterns, contrasting with the earth tones and oversized clothes of those in her court. The hem swelled and flowed as she walked down the stairs towards the throng of her subjects, revealing white shoes. Her ink-black hair had been pulled back into a ponytail, elaborately decorated with gold and silver flowers and butterflies, save for her fringe and two long, straight tendrils framing her face. It was clear the man with her was of a higher rank than the other people in the room. He was dressed in a black robe with an azure waistband. The young lady's icy blue eyes scanned the room before landing on Tepid. It seems we have extra company today. Her voice was soft, yet firm. As you predicted, your ladyship, the man said his voice wise and calm. She looked up at him and smiled sweetly in response. You give me far too much credit, Agar. We all know you are gifted in foresight dreams, Lady Mamia. At this the room erupted into applause for her ladyship. Tepid scanned Mamia up and down. Psst! Annie! Dominator tugged Annie's sleeve and whispered into her ear. Why is he wearing a dress? Abrian clipped him on the back of the head and motioned him to be quiet. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, I have guests today. However, do not let this deter you from airing whatever issues you and those you speak for have. She began to sit and two servants swiftly pushed forward in a perfectly timed motion, a smaller version of the massive throne behind for her to rest on. As she sat, all the courtiers bowed low and then took their seats. 
Air motioned for the ATR and Tepid to do the same, which they did, except for Dominator, who received another clip round the head from Abrian before he would bow. After a short amount of time, one of the nobles stood up. My sweet lady, gracious leader, highest authority, illustrious light on our lands. As he spoke, his arms made grand swooping gestures around his head while he remained careful not to hit those around him. Those I speak for have been concerned about our new taxation system. They are afraid we are not taxing enough and will not have enough funds in reserve in case of famine. After he finished speaking, he respectfully bowed his head. Mamia sat quietly, carefully considering the situation presented. Tepid thought to himself how strange that people were complaining about not being taxed more than usual. At last she spoke. Raise your head, Metin. Those you speak for need not fear. As you well know, although they are paying less, those who can afford to are paying more. This makes up the difference, and thus we will have plenty of provisions in case of famine or disaster. As long as those with more give more, then the system will work. If they do not, and are found out, then there will be appropriate consequences. If they are still worried after your careful and true testimony at this court, may I suggest you make an extra contribution to the Treasury, so that they can rest assured that you shall not let them perish? Metin's hands clenched as he suddenly realised his mistake. He looked up, smiling from ear to ear. Tepid raised an eyebrow as he took in the man's obviously fake smile. Thank you, oh fair lady, how wise and wonderful you are. Metin's voice cracked slightly as he bowed low again and collapsed into his seat. This continued. Each time a problem was brought to her attention, Mamia answered it with common sense and wisdom in equal measures. Soon, no one else had any further questions, queries or worries. Agar looked at Mamia and she nodded. All rise, he said loudly, his voice filling up the open space in the throne room. Slowly, all the nobles left. Mamia sat poised on the throne, watching the sea of people stream out into the courtyard. A secret signal passed between Agar and Air. Air motioned to the ATR to stand and follow him. Mamie arose and took Agar's hand once again and they all walked through a door behind Mamie's throne. The door was rather small and innocuous but the room it led to was a very large library. The walls were a rich green behind the floor to ceiling bookcases. In the centre of the room was a large table with a map embedded into the wood. EA's eyes widened as he took it all in. GA was sure his twin was about to start drooling. The group moved in and dispersed, impressed by the size and contents of the room. I say, Mamia, your family's collection has grown significantly since I was last here, Tepid proclaimed, taking in the room. Have you been collecting much? Oh. Tepid's voice trailed off as he turned to see Mamia curled up on the floor, Agar fanning her gently as she hyperventilated. She had turned very pale and seemed to have lost control of her breathing. In through the nose, out through the mouth, Agar said soothingly. Air appeared at his side with a glass of water and a handkerchief in his hands. Is everything all right? Tepid said, crouching near Agar, who didn't seem fazed by his ladyship's sudden turn. One by one, the ATR slowly noticed and watched from where they stood. Yes, she will be fine. Agar said calmly. She doesn't deal well with the expectations put upon her since her father's passing. Ah, oh, I heard about that. My condolences, Tepid said, a note of sadness in his voice. I still feel all of this could have been avoided if her father hadn't been so neglig- Air was cut off by Agar shooting him a dark glare. I- I'm all right now. Mamia said, slowly sitting up. Are you sure? Tepid said as Air handed her the glass. Yes, she said breathily. 
Taking a sip from the glass, her breathing became more even and the colour began to return to her cheeks. Tepid shuffled, so he sat next to her. Mimia, are you sure you're quite well? Tepid asked again, concerned. Yes, Tepid. I just... Mamia faltered slightly. I'm still getting used to speaking publicly, especially to them. So why do you still do it? Annie said, seeming to have appeared from nowhere and now sitting cross-legged in front of the prince and her ladyship. Mamia looked taken aback and Air placed his hand on his forehead again. Well, it's how father did it and how people expect it to be done. Mamia responded unconfidently. But it hurts you, Annie said, tilting her head. Morphia had now joined Air in grimacing behind her hand. I... yes, but... <sighs> Mamia shrank into herself slightly. Maybe now isn't the time for this talk, my dear Annie, Tepid said, smiling awkwardly. Annie looked at them both and, although she wanted to ask more questions, decided against it as she felt Morphia's glare burning into her back. <clears throat> Agar cleared his throat. Tepid, sir? As per your letter, Mamia has been researching the meteorological phenomenon you've described. Is it not affecting you here? Tepid asked quizzically. This season is normally fairly rainy for our island. Air responded. If it is affecting us, we aren't really aware of it. I see, said Tepid, thoughtfully rubbing his chin. I'll show you what I found, Mamia said, as Agar helped her stand and moved towards the table. The rest of the group joined them around the map. Agar waved his hand over it, revealing several land masses circled in blue magic. Beside the map, a large and very well-read book was lying open. Several of its pages had been marked with velvet bookmarks. So far we have found these locations that seem to be connected with the surge in the wet weather, Mamia began to explain. We speculate it is being caused by some sort of creature that may reside about here, she said, pointing to what seemed to be open ocean. Uh, there's nothing there. Dominator observed, ducking just out of the way of Abrian's hand as it was about to clip him again. I know, Mamia agreed, shifting slightly. We believe it could be an aquatic creature, but we aren't certain yet. So why do we need to go to these places? Questioned Hano. Well, we think these places contain ingredients for a coming... Mamia stood with a furrowed brow, wondering how to describe it. Treat? Consumable? Cake? Annie chimed in. <laughs> I suppose so. Mamia nodded. Annie's face lit up and she started bouncing up and down on her heels. What exactly are we looking for then? G.A. asked, floating above them. Flower! Annie said happily. Actually, young one, you're searching for mermaid scales and goruma soisha. Agar corrected. The ATR fell silent. G.A. shot E.A. a meaningful glance. Mermaids were endangered and incredibly rare. No one knew where to find them, but some people believed their scales were full of concentrated magic. As for the second ingredient, most of them didn't even feel sure they knew how to spell Gormasolsha, let alone what it was. According to our research, we believe mermaid scales, combined with the Gormasoisha, should make a powerful... Uh... Potion? Poison? Pill? Mamia leant over the book, trying to translate the fiddly words. Something like that, anyway. That won't be a very nice cake, Annie said, scrunching up her face. Good thing we won't be eating the potion poison pill, isn't it? Hono commented mockingly. We know that you need to go to the distant island of Illa to find the Gormasoisha, but we're struggling on the location for the mermaid scales, Mamia said thoughtfully. We were hoping to have it worked out before you came to visit, but... She looked up, a little flustered. Uh, oh, but rest assured, we have a second book here, which we have just started to read. She motioned to Air to fetch it. 
It should hold a clue about how to make Oh, the- confound her! Air shouted from atop a ladder, resting against a bookcase. Air, is everything... Agar began. She has moved the books around again, Air said, exceedingly frustrated. Agar groaned, his shoulders sinking considerably. Um, can we help? Tepid said cautiously. No, not unless we all go and search. Ugh. Air's sentence ended in a groan, and he rested his head against the bookcase. Well, it will have to be me and our guests. You two were banned after last time. <laughs> Mamia said with a half smile. I apologize, your ladyship. I didn't realize there was an order to them. Air grumped as he shuffled down the ladder. I'm sorry, but I'm really confused. Where are we supposed to be looking? Morphia asked, beginning to feel annoyed. I've not been to the archive in a long time, Tepid said, as everyone wandered down a path behind Mamia's palace. <laughs> well, you haven't been here in a long time, Mamia laughed, as they made their way through the sodden garden under large cloth canopies held over them by air and agar. I've been meaning to ask, Morphia piped up. How do you two know each other? Oh, yes, Mamia and I met each other as children, Tepid said nostalgically. Our parents wanted to strengthen the bond between our countries, so I would often visit as a child to, um, make friends. I think they envisaged an engagement with my older sister, Mamia laughed. Delilah shuddered. Remembering a similar situation. Yes, but your older sisters were... How do I put this politely? Fiani was rude, Shalita wasn't interested in boys, and Talina was more interested in the food that the bull's father held. <laughs> Mamia said, giggling. So, wait, we weren't in the archive just now? Dominator asked, interrupting this reminiscence. I thought that was obvious, Dommy, Hono said, sighing. Not to me, the young prince huffed as they continued on. Shh! I want to hear this, Annie said, flapping a hand at Dominator. <laughs> it's really not that interesting, Annie, Tepid half laughed. It is to me, said Morphia with a smile Tepid recognised as her tell me or else smile. Well, we met at one of the many balls my father held, Mamia said, oblivious to this. Tepid and his family came as guests of honour, but my siblings weren't exactly receptive to him. And then I found you on the balcony reading, Tepid said. Yes, Mother was never happy that people wanted to see me at balls. I never understood why. You were quite charming, all things considered. Yes, but... I would also have one of my episodes unless you or Agar were there. Mamia continued, smiling at Agar. So what happened with the marriage proposal? Delilah chimed in, hoping that Morpheus' suspicion wasn't an angry sort of suspicion. The gardens were too nice to burn. Well, father didn't think I was quite right, and eventually the whole thing was forgotten. Mamia said wistfully. That's when we started writing letters as our visit stopped, Tepid said, acutely aware of Morphia. Father took my siblings to visit other nations and strengthened ties there, but... Mamia's voice trailed off, and her walking speed slowed until she stopped altogether. Lady Mamia? Air said gently. Ah, oh, sorry. We're almost there, Mamia said, and she began walking again. Morphia looked from her to Tepid. She knew the look on Tepid's face very well. There was something the poor girl wasn't saying, and Tepid knew what it was. But it was something sad. As they continued through the gardens, decorated with more tiled patterns and tinkling fountains, G.A. thought he could hear a soft humming. Something flew past his head, and he saw a bee weaving its way to a collection of conical, woven hives, arranged in a semicircle around a blank, grassy space, encircled with large slabs of stone. Agar stopped and opened what appeared to be a trap door in the ground. 
Underneath was a set of stone stairs that seemed to descend forever into blackness. Mamia started down first and descended into the dark, followed swiftly by Tepid. The rest of the group looked at each other and then followed. Air and Agar remained outside, waving away the occasional curious bee. The further they went, the darker it became. Unnaturally dark, in fact. G.A. felt sure something was watching them, but in this darkness it was impossible to tell. Even his natural glow was significantly dimmed. Slowly a light came into view. A small beeswax candle on a table in front of a set of grey curtains. Mamie motioned for the group to wait as she pulled one back and entered. Silence enveloped them. It was strange not being able to hear the rain any more. So, Morphea said, breaking the silence, her voice sounding almost muffled despite there being nothing apparent to stop the sound. What isn't she telling us? Ah, uh, it's all fairly recent, so I think it's still a raw nerve for her, Tepid said, his voice equally muffled. Like she said, her father took her siblings out to other nations. There was an accident and their ship sank. They couldn't find any of her family or the crew from the boat. Or, quite frankly, the boat itself. I see, said Morphia. She's been thrust into this role no one prepared her for because they didn't think she was good enough. If she'd been taught in her formative years, she could have been not only a good ruler, but a confident one. Instead, while she is in fact excellent, she prefers the world within her books to the world her subjects live in. She cares deeply for them, but doesn't know how to cope. Tepid ended sadly. E.A. suddenly found himself empathising with Mamia strongly. The silence slowly crept back in around them. After a few more moments, Mamia reappeared and beckoned them to follow her. They entered through what looked like a wooden porch into a cavernous space filled with so much silence that even the air seemed to walk on tiptoe. The archive was cool and dimly lit. It appeared to be one long space like a hall with a smooth stone floor. Shafts of dusty light fell from high above, casting deep shadows in the gaps between incredibly tall shelves lined along each wall. These were packed so close there was only a thin, straight corridor of flagstones running along the spine of the hall. Every inch of every shelf was taken up with a myriad of carefully organised books. Thick, weighty tomes, thin, cloth-bound volumes, every size and shape, every language you'd heard of and more you hadn't. It seemed everything that had ever happened in the world had been written down and stored away in this hall. G.A. heard a small gasp from E.A., who was gazing wide-eyed at the towering shelves. Can I help you? Everyone except Mamia jumped. A pair of eyes had been watching them from a shadowed table. A steaming samovar was set on one corner with a neat pile of books on the other. The eyes certainly didn't look willing to offer help. Mamia silently motioned the ATR to introduce themselves. Abrian stepped forward cautiously. <coughs> we... <coughs> We are the anti-tepid revolution, he said. We're travelling to stop the rain, and we've been told this archive might have a book in here that will help us. The eyes narrowed, then rose and advanced around the table, their owner emerging almost, but not entirely, into the light. The archivist was dressed in colours very similar to those of the archive itself. Her clothes seemed to involve a robe of some sort, and her eyebrows were peculiarly long, framing her eyes which gleamed golden in the gloom. She gave them a long, appraising look, taking in each of them one at a time. This one must stay outside, she said, pointing to Annie. Dominator bristled at once, but Mamia shot him an imploring glance. G.A. wondered privately if the archivist had a good sense of intuition. Annie simply shrugged with a grin. I don't mind, it smells funny here anyway, she said, turning and trotting back outside. The archivist returned her unblinking stare to the others. 
there's a lot of them, she said at length. They are travelling together, each skilled in their own way, explained Mamia. I'm sure they think they are, says the archivist, not taking her eyes from them. With more of them, they will be able to search for the book quickly, and so leave quickly as well, said Mamia delicately. The archivist remained unmoved, but after a very strained silence, she finally nodded to Mamia and returned to her desk, though her eyes remained fixed on the ATR as one by one they shuffled past. G.A. glided through the archive as carefully as he could. His last trip to somewhere like this had ended with an accidental visit to the netherworld. The fabric of reality had suffered enough, he reasoned. All the same, he couldn't help but be amazed at the incredible variety of age, colour and size of the books. Some looked so old they didn't look like books at all, more like collections of thin stone slabs bound with mysterious metals. Others had covers of solid silver encrusted with hundreds of minuscule gemstones. Drifting up to the ceiling, G.A. was able to look over the maze of shelves and wondered how many secrets and how much memory must be stored away in this hall. Abrin, Hono and the others found the place far more disconcerting, though E.A. had disappeared into a corner at once, never to be seen again if he had his way. As Mamia led them up the length of the hall, Hono couldn't stop looking over his shoulder. There was something unsettling about the archivist. Every so often, the rows of shelves were punctuated by desks, each with their own beeswax candle. He could have sworn he'd seen the archivist seated by the doorway when they set off, but then there she was, reading from a sheaf of parchment on the desk they had just passed. Several rows later, and she was in the shadows of a shelf, returning several volumes to their rightful place. Her eyes flicked towards them, and Hono quickly looked away and sped up. This place was downright strange. Aha! Mamia found the shelf she was looking for. I believe the book you need should be down here. It has a thick silver crest on its spine. You all know what you're looking for better than me. I'll wait outside and keep out of your way. She ducked to one side to allow them to pass, despite there being more than enough room for her to stay and help. Her lack of confidence seemed to have got the better of her. Tepid gave a quick bow to the others and a smile that said, Seems you're on your own now, I suppose. Enjoy yourselves! Before swiftly following after her. Abrin, Hono, Morphia and Dominator looked up at the bookshelves either side of them. Then up a little more. Then a bit more still book with a silver crest. They couldn't even see the books at the top. G.A., whispered Morphia, but G.A. was off exploring somewhere. Bother, where's the flying one when you need him? Where's Delilah gone? said Dominator, swivelling around. Must have gone looking somewhere else, shrugged Abrian. Now, Hono, you know you love me. I'm not letting you climb on me. We need to see, and you're the taller one. Just to make things interesting, how about I stand on your shoulders for once? Just get on with it, snapped Morphia, who was already standing on the tips of her formidable boots. She was actually shorter than both of them, and had her boots made especially in nausea to make sure she could look her prey in the eye. In the end, Abrian drew the short straw, and Honor was soon peering unsteadily at row after row of books on the shelf in front. Dominator was standing on Morphia's shoulders as he checked the shelf behind them. It will be worth it. It will be worth it, Morphia growled to herself through gritted teeth as the prince accidentally kicked her head for the third time. Find a book, stop the rain, go home. Find a book, stop the rain, go home. Left. No, left, hissed Hono, as he directed Abrian along the shelf. I know my lefts. I'm left-handed, snapped Abrian. I can't see you pointing anyway, and I might add, I think you've put on weight. As their whispered bickering continued, Delilah softly walked beside the shelves further down the long passage. 
She could see G.A. circling atop a row nearby. A bee seemed to have flown in through one of the shafts in the roof and had taken an interest in him. Delilah sniffed. The air smelled so peculiar. It was like the smell she'd noticed when they left the ship. If anything, it was stronger in this archive. But only her mother had such a powerful scent of white magic, and Delilah felt confident the White Queen wouldn't have ever travelled this far from Feldnor before. She watched as G.A. evaded the bee's attention, all of this running through her mind. The archivist did have an impressive set of eyebrows. Delilah wondered if there would be any books in here about the genealogy of guardian beings. Ah, stop, stop! Hono swayed, his tail waving wildly as he steadied himself, Abrian holding on to his legs. I found the book. It's on the shelf above. Get me as high up as you can, Abrian. Dominator and Morphia watched while Hono strained to reach the thin volume above him. For a brief moment, he thought he saw movement in the shadows to their right, but kept reaching. After several seconds more, he couldn't help but glance to his right again. A pair of golden eyes was watching him from the gloom. When he next looked, they had moved inexplicably closer, though he hadn't heard a sound. He went to reach again, but then nearly fell onto the shelf as Adrian adjusted his position. Do you mind? Sorry! Hono stretched as far as he could, ignoring the creeping feeling coming over him. He was sure something was drawing ever closer and closer to him. Gotcha! He jumped down from Abrian's shoulders and Abrian nearly fell over, but Morphia caught him. With the book in his hands at last, Hono couldn't fight the horrible feeling any more and turned to his right again. The archivist was at the end of the row, blocking the exit. Her eyes narrowed as she slowly walked towards them, though they couldn't hear a single footstep. Hono stayed absolutely still, holding the book tightly. The archivist stopped, her face very close to his. Abrian wondered if she was about to snatch the book away. Then, in a seamless movement, she produced a pair of soft gloves out of who knew where and held them out to Hono. His shoulders sagged with relief. He donned the gloves and carried the book over to one of the desks. The archivist melted back into the shadows, though two tiny specks of light showed she was still watching them very closely as they opened her precious book. Inside was an illuminated manuscript. Each page was filled with impossibly intricate borders, letters and illustrations. Nestling amongst these were squares of wide-lettered black text. After peeling through page after page with his gloved hands, Hono saw an illustration of what must have been a mermaid. The artist had hidden it within the heavily decorated borders where it looked out from the page through thick, reed-like hair. Bending over the book with Abrin, Morphia and Dominate appearing over his shoulder, Hono read, Waves of the water meet lights on high, Watched by windlords who dancing fly, merry maids far away do sleep beneath mantles of watery sky. Merry maids magic floweth through uplifted voices high and sweet, for seas of green and calm. Low winds are foul with wrathful waters, harmonizing sea and soul to all equilibrium. A most powerful combination of natural magic is procured from essence of. Oh, that's how you spell it. Gorama Solcha and bone, skin, or scale of merry maids, each potent on their own when met and sealed with purest white magic, produces results most efficacious. Look ye to this configuration of magics, for they shall remedy all discord within. Waves, wind, magic? What? said Dominator, wrinkling his nose. It's not very forthcoming about where to find mermaids, mumbled Hono, scanning the page again. Actually, if you read it carefully, those slanted words say, Windlords. Morphia pointed to the first line. I know that Windlords are from the cold desert in the land called Tenga Sharu. Tenga, pardon? Morphia rolled her eyes. 
Close-minded failed notions. It's a long way across the sea. In fact, if I remember right, the coastline of Tenga Sheru shreds into the sea, making a collection of islands strung not too far apart. You mean an archipelago? Cut in Abrian, always fond of long words. And one of those islands is called Illa. Morphia continued, ignoring him. Dominator clapped his hands. Brilliant! Then we should find our two ingredients in nearly the same place, he said. The Goma Soilishi on the island of Illa, and the mermaid scales in the sea near Tenga Achu. And once we've got both, we can use Delilah's white magic to combine them into the treat pill potion thing, like Mamie has said. Added Hono happily. Then find the rain monster that's waking up, shove it up its nose, and go home. And he shut the book as he stood up. Let's tell the others. Excuse me. Came a small voice from above them. All four looked up. Could you please make this thing leave me alone? G A ducked and dodged, then finally made his exit through the wall, pursued by the persistent B. At Mamia's invitation, the anti-tepid revolution stayed in her fine house that night before the start of their long journey the next morning. At dinner, four musicians discreetly played for them on mournful, thin, stringed instruments. The dining room lit by a dim cluster of lamps dangling just above the table. The meal set before them was full of things they had never seen done to vegetables before, with nets stretched over sour yellow fruits to stop pits dripping through tiny leaves of herbs that they weren't sure were real, and minuscule portions of sweet things that melted to reveal hidden treats. Annie and Dominator were about to reach for their fifth helpings, but were battered away by Abrian, whose hand was beginning to feel stiff from that day's head cuffing. Meanwhile, G.A. found he was far less interested in the culinary curiosities, choosing to float near the carved ceiling and listen to the conversation between Tepid and Mamia, which had been flowing almost unbroken since they had left the archive. And now, of course, with thanks to your studious efforts, they do seem to be on the right path. So, all seems well, Tepid was saying, sipping from his goblet. How peculiar that you should be so friendly with the group who deposed you, said Mamia thoughtfully. I confess until today I had never met a failed notion before, though I've read about them, obviously. They're quite unique in their own way. Almost charming, I suppose. Her eyes glanced across to Hono, Delilah and Dominator, who were carefully working out if some of the ornamental flowers on their dishes were for eating or not. And they have bought a ghost! Now those are fascinating things, though there was only ever one book in the archive on the topic of ghosts— and the archivist would never let me near it. Far too valuable to actually be read, I would imagine. Ah, that reminds me. She looked to the musicians as they finished the final strains of their piece. The leader sighed and nodded to his companions. One by one, they began packing up their instruments. It surely isn't that late, is it? Asked Tepid, bemused. Not at all, Your Highness, said the leader. But... There are certain rules about playing music after hours. Let's not name names, but let's say they prefer things to be kept at a low volume. The archivist, you mean, said Delilah curiously. The musicians nodded. I teach the village children in the daytime, said one. I once suggested we try to involve the children in the archive. Have storytelling and crafts, you know. What did she say to that? Tepid said. Well, all but one of the children have been found now, but I'm sure Zahel will turn up sooner or later. The musician hitched up their instrument case awkwardly. <clears throat> Good evening, one and all, your ladyship. And they bowed out of the room. Tepid thought it best to take another sip from his goblet rather than make a comment. Mamia sighed and smiled. A ship has been prepared for you, your highness, for your departure tomorrow. Tepid only slightly inhaled his drink. He did it very gracefully, as a well-trained prince would. <coughs> oh, indeed. Going home, he said, wiping his mouth carefully. I do wish you all the best of luck with your significant meeting, continued Mamia, placing a hand on his arm. 
I would be just as nervous if it were me, given the circumstances. She looked kindly at him. Tepid went a little pale at the edges. I confess in all the fun of the last few days I'd forgotten about it. Do let me know how it goes, if it all goes well, said Mamia sincerely. Yes, quite, said Tepid, hurriedly adding the best response he could think of. Suddenly the morning of departure was all too near, but inevitably it came, gently drifting over the misty peak of the Aral Isle, lacing the ground with chilly dew and the air with the sounds of seabirds. A second ship was floating beside their own when the ATR descended back down the stone steps. It made their squashed little nausean vessel look very underdressed, with all its fine carved masts, elegant prow and golden woodwork. This was the ship prepared at Mamia's order to take Prince Tepid back to Nausea, while Abrian, Hono and the others continued on with Captain Ula and his sailors. Armed with their refreshed plan, they would be sailing far away to the island of Illa, the distant seas around Tenga Sheru, and then on to whatever was making the rain. Gia couldn't wait to get away from the island and its bees, but Delilah was less keen. The island smelt nice, the adventure lying ahead smelt of waves and a lurching boat. She had to remind herself her seasickness wouldn't last forever. After all, this was an adventure straight out of a storybook, and no one in those adventures got seasick. It would definitely wear off. Eventually. Agar and Mamia had followed to see them off. She stood, cloaked in delicate, light green, the rain adding extra decoration to the tiny gems on her hood. It has been an enlightening experience meeting each of you, she said, bowing to Dominator. It has been... it's been very... well, the food was... It was nice to meet you too, Lady Mania. Sorry, Mamia, apologised Dominator, picking his words carefully as he spotted her hands shaking a little. When's Tepid coming? His Highness, the Prince of Norcia, has elected to make preparations for departure on the ship we have provided, said Agar. He will be setting sail a little later than yourselves, though he instructed me to bid you all the very best of journeys. Dominator shrugged and wiped his nose. Fair enough, if he wants to do all that sort of thing. I've got some adventuring to do. He gave the second ship a half-hearted salute and turned to leave. But Mamia made to speak. Your Highness, if I may. Dominator paused mid-stride. She stepped closer, leaning down to his level. The sea holds many secrets. This task, this journey, is not for the faint-hearted. Please, take care of all of them. Dominator frowned. I will, he said uncertainly. Did she think he was nervous? Scared? None of them were. They knew exactly what they had to do. Mamia straightened up and Dominator strode away, glancing over his shoulder as he went. Mooring lines on the long dock were untied from their posts and long poles lowered to push the ship away. Would you like to leave now, my lady? asked Dagar. Mamia nodded quietly and took his hand as he led the way back up the steps, but they had to stop and make way as Ea skidded down the path, hurrying after the departing ship with his bag swinging against his shoulder. "'Why are you so late?' called Morphia as he scrambled up the gangplank, just as it was about to be pulled away. "'I... I... over... overslept,' panted Ea casting his bag down and sitting on it for a moment as he got his breath back. Are we leaving now? We would have been five minutes ago if you hadn't held us up, Morpheus scowled. Sorry, said Ea. Will we be leaving now, though? And will the boat be moving very fast soon? Are you in a hurry? asked G.A. curiously, hanging upside down above his brother. Um, just... Very ready to leave and get on with the adventure and save our home and stop the rain like all of you, said Ea, trying what he thought was an adventurous, patriotic smile. G.A. thought it looked like toothache. I don't appreciate latecomers, 
said Captain Ula from behind them, making them all jump. If any of you delay this venture, making it more unnecessarily arduous and drawn out than it needs to be, I will cut off your ankles, and for each late arrival after, I will keep chopping, working upwards. Understood. EA nodded nervously. He didn't want Abrian to have an excuse to stitch him back together for a second time. The first was bad enough. yelled Annie as she dangled from the shrouds and waved to the second ship. Say hello to your smelly city for us! The second ship maintained a diplomatic silence as they pulled away, so Annie tried shouting louder until Abrian and Hono plucked her off the ropes. Mamia and Agar watched from the cliff top until the little ship was well into the open waters before they turned and walked away. Though her hands shook, Mamia held her head high. They would be all right. They would stop the rain, these strange people and their ghost. One day she might see them again, and then she would know she wasn't wrong. They would all be all right.